Good evening. I'm Jennifer Copeland with the North Carolina Council of Churches, and I greet you on behalf of the 18 denominations that are the North Carolina Council. I welcome you to this intersection of faith and art. The council lives in intersections like this, where we attempt to bring the lens of faith to bear on the matters of everyday life. Generally, this is done by bracketing public policy by our faith claims and reminding folks that the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament gospels provide the tools we need to enact legislation that will allow all God's people to flourish. But until humanity is brave enough to embrace the beloved community, we are grateful to places like Haywood Street United Methodist Church for providing us a glimpse of what it can look like. We have an all-star cast with us here tonight who will share that story. The filmmaker, Christopher Zalewski is here, and we also have the privilege of three panelists who will share their perspective of the intersection of faith and art, faith in action. The Reverend Brian Combs is founding pastor of Haywood Street United Methodist Church in Asheville and can share much with us about his ministry there and his vision for this fresco. Ms. Jeanette King is part of the Haywood Street community and one of the important faces immortalized by the fresco. Ms. Christina Carnes Ananias is a candidate for the Doctor of Theology from Duke Divinity School with a particular academic interest in the intersection of art and theology. So the questions of why we do what we do and why we draw what we draw are the things we have come here tonight to talk about. I hope you feel your spirits lifted by the things that are said here. And now, Chris, I ask if you would get us started by sharing some of your vision for this remarkable documentary. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you to the North Carolina Council of Churches for hosting the screening and the Q&A tonight, and for everybody who's here, I really appreciate um, the support and the and the um, uh, just keeping the, the story of Haywood Street and the, the story of the fresco going. Um, so my name is Christopher Zalowski, and I'm, I'm based in uh, Winston-Salem. Uh, I wanted to give just a few quick um, uh, tidbits about the backstory of this film. Uh, before I turned it over to uh, Reverend Combs. Um, so I teach in the documentary film program at Wake Forest, um, which is a kind of my creative hub. And it, it allows me to uh, um, look for stories and it, you know, I have to actually as part of my job, but uh, I, I, I tend to look for local stories in North Carolina. And um, when I found this story, I was living in Asheville um, and it was actually, uh, brought to me by um, a woman named Brooke Vanderlyn, who is the storyteller in residence at Haywood Street. And um, already that should give you a sense of how much Haywood Street values the power of story. And she told me a little bit about the fresco. And I, I went to an early dialogue session that happened in the sanctuary. And I thought I was going to be maybe filming five or six times and possibly creating a five or 10 minute short that Haywood Street could use for, for fundraising. And after three years of filming and 60 plus shoots and uh, really turning it into a passion project for me, um, it, it is uh, the film that, that, that uh, it is now, the film that you've seen, um, a feature length documentary. And so I really um, got drawn to that, uh, to the idea of the fresco and the themes behind it. Um, and for me, uh, I was drawn mostly to this idea. And that was the juxtaposition uh, between those whom society has cast aside, uh, mixed with being immortalized in an ancient art form that preserves for centuries. And those two ideas, um, were really what drew me into the story and kept me going um, and kept me so interested in it. And um, I think that's what speaks to a lot of folks who come in and see the fresco uh, in the sanctuary of Haywood Street. Um, so I edited the film uh, with that concept in mind. Um, I mean, you, you meet the models and then you see them in the fresco immediately after meeting them. And that is with that idea of the juxtaposition in mind. And so, um, uh, for me, that's what, what kept it going. And you're, you're really looking at the, at the production crew right now. I was the director, the cinematographer, and the editor. 
um, and it truly was a, a passion project. And so uh, when, I, when I thank you for your interest and your support of this project, I, I really mean it uh, because it, it really was um, uh, a project that took you know, everything for, for three years. And one last thing I'll say before I, I turn it over to Reverend Combs is um, the artwork side of this, this story is really interesting. And um, North Carolina has a pretty unique uh, history with frescoes, uh, starting with uh, uh, fresco artist Benjamin Long, who's, who's in the film and lives uh, in Brevard and has kind of cultivated this community of apprentices who um, have learned from him, and he's certainly considered a master of the fresco, um, and have kind of continued doing uh, contemporary frescoes, especially in Western North Carolina. I mean, even uh, the Washington Post had an article, uh, I believe it was a week, a week or two ago, about the North Carolina fresco trail, and just how unique that is. I mean, contemporary frescoes are incredibly rare, um, but in North Carolina, there's a, there's a lot of them. And so I felt also a sense of pride helping to share that story. And so um, I, I don't wanna speak for too long. Um, I'm happy to answer any film related questions near the end of this program, um, but uh, I'm, I'm happy that the, the film resonated with many of you and um, uh, keep spreading the word. I mean, the film is really in the early days of, of of being released. It, it premiered at the River Run Film Festival in Winston-Salem last week. Um, so it's just now starting to be seen, you know, quote, publicly. Um, and we've done a handful of these types of, um, you know, community screening events. Uh, and there'll be a couple more uh, this summer with the North Carolina United Methodist Conference. Um, and so uh, if you have an organization or a part of an organization that you think would benefit from this film, reach out, let me know. Um, and spread the word. I, I greatly appreciate it. So um, with that, um, I, I, the, I, I will uh, introduce uh, Reverend Brian Combs, who um, uh, is the founder of Haywood Street Congregation, and really was, um, I mean, such an instrumental part of the fresco, obviously, but also the film. I mean, I feel like he was a big part to, to welcome me into this community and um, uh, really just got me so excited about the pot potential of this project. So, um, uh, Brian, I will pass it over to you. I'm so glad to be here as well. I'll, I'll start with a brief biography of, of my uh, life, and that is, like Chris, I have two small kids that may walk in the door behind me. Uh, so if my screen goes black for a minute, just know I, I, I was literally taking someone to the potty a moment ago. But Nevertheless, so uh, so honored to the invitation to be here. I, I have many mentors that have been part of the North Carolina Council of Churches and your remarkable work. So I'm, I feel privileged to, to join you all. I'll start with the word of uh, appreciation for Chris. Uh, over the years, Haywood Street and our 11 year existence has uh, welcomed many videographers and journalists over the years to uh, do profiles on our ministry and what was clear to me about Chris is that he was able to express empathy through a camera lens. And that is, that is something that is not necessarily natural to everyone. Uh, the, the videographer can take up space, can uh, create a forum that uh, is less about the, um, the person on the other side of the lens, but, but Chris over and over again refused to treat people as object, but rather only as sacred subject. And the, the documentary in, in so many ways uh, portrays that. You can feel the sensitivity with which he, he treated each person like Jeanette uh, and others. I'm a United Methodist minister. Uh, I serve in the downtown uh, homeless corridor of Asheville. When I was in seminary, I read a little book called Jesus and the Disinherited by Howard Thurman, and it was impactful. Uh, every bit as much as, as the Gospel of Luke has been on my calling and conversion story in many ways. And I grew up in Charlotte at a suburban church. But when I read Thurman, it was literally not that the world was turned upside down, but that it was finally turned right side up. And as we remember, many of the 
radical precepts of Thurman, uh, who, in my opinion, was the first liberation theologian. Uh, he never gets credit for that, but I, I believe he was the forerunner. He just made a simple premise, and that was, look at the way God has chosen to re reveal God's self. This is not an accident. Jesus comes among us as a brown Palestinian born into poverty and to a world that had no uh, room in the end for him. His kind was not welcome. His parents were paupers. His mother, uh, of course, was the scorn of uh, the neighborhood for getting pregnant out of wedlock. Joseph was considering divorce. And then when Jesus grew up, he, he hung around with women of the night and folks today that we would say uh, could only live in Broughton Hospital. And this was his life. And uh, Thurman so articulated a theology that resonated with me. And when I graduated, I simply wanted to follow uh, Thurman's direction. And uh, in the United Methodist Church, we get appointed uh, by a bishop. And when it came my turn, there was, there was no urban ministry in our conference to serve at. And so it was clear that to invent something was the only way that I was going to be able to serve. And there were a handful of us that raised our hand to be pioneering folks on the front end. We had no template. We had no demographic study. Uh, we still don't in a lot of ways, but we did feel led. And, and here we are 11 years later. I'll give you a brief synopsis of who we are as a ministry. Again, following Thurman, the, the calling of Haywood Street is not to be Jesus, but it's rather to welcome the Jesus in our midst. And he shows up regularly. He's often uh, uncleanly. He's not showered. He woke up in a tent active psychosis. He probably has needle marks on his arm, uh, and he certainly doesn't have a permanent address. And rather than trying to evangelize that Jesus who is coming uh, to Haywood Street, our responsibility instead is to, to welcome him, uh, to learn from him, uh, to, to bring our own brokenness to that relationship, uh, and then to see how, how God will transform our lives. We began very simply with worship. There was a fellow named John in Pritchard Park downtown, Asheville, who said, middle of the week, middle of the day is when I get high the most. If you did a church service then, that's what I'd rather be doing. We organized around worship. Likewise, we, we loitered on the corner of poverty and heard many people say, I can eat in lots of places in Asheville, but that experience is ultimately dehumanizing. I wait in line. It's food someone threw, it, threw away on a styrofoam plate, I have to face a wall, uh, scarf down that meal, and then someone else takes my chair. So we started the welcome table. It's a homemade affair with 50 of the, the best independent restaurants in Asheville. Uh, all the best ingredients you can imagine, circular tables, a wait staff, flowering centerpieces, candles, uh, everything you want to eat off of homemade pottery plates and, and glass stemware. Started a respite center. We noticed that many uh, folks come out of the hospital who are unhoused and there's no way to heal on the street. So you can come and live with us. We have nurses, we manage your uh, medication and follow up appointments. Um, we have a garden that's led by folks who are struggling with addiction and are in and out of poverty and a variety of other ministries. Uh, the fresco has become the newest offering uh, that we have felt led to. And it began with a simple conversation. Uh, Christopher Holt, who is our principal artist, started hanging around the back pew of Haywood Street on Wednesdays. He would sit at the table and come to worship and just start sketching people. And he had this audacious calling to to do his own fresco. Chris alluded to this earlier. There, there is no such thing as a contemporary fresco. It's such an antiquated art form. It's so expensive, laborious, that it, it simply doesn't happen anymore. But, but Chris had been seasoned enough after being an apprentice for over a decade to say, I want to give this a shot. And so he asked me for some grounding scriptures uh, that have formed Haywood Street over the years. And uh, the Beatitudes was one of them. Christopher went to Cuba for a month, and, and God started working on him. And as we sat together for many, many hours, what became so clear through that process was the Beatitudes are so incredibly subversive. They literally are, whatever is countercultural, that, that is the gospel truth. Whatever the world is doing, do the opposite of it. 
Uh, if warmongering is celebrated, then it's the peacemakers that are blessed. If it's uh, the folks who are in power and privilege that get ahead, then blessed are the poor. And you just go through each uh, blessing to see the way in which God intends our world to be, even if the kingdom is breaking in, if we get these momentary glances and, and, and yet we're, we're not quite there. Uh, throughout the process of the fresco, what, what touched me most deeply was in the same way Chris used an empathetic lens to, to shoot the documentary, Christopher Holt used an empathetic paintbrush, and he would sit with each model for hours on end. He would, he would curate the experience around what they cared about. What kind of music would you like to listen to? Can we go to Bojangles afterwards? Can we take a drive somewhere? To this day, Chris is still sharing life with many of the folks that he had a chance to, to memorialize in a drawing. And he would capture them with uh, charcoal and paper in real life and then blow those up to these cartoon sized drawings like the ancient masters did. And then um, through a process, literally take bags of chalk and um, connect the dots after poking holes in all these huge drawings to to create a template on the plaster wall and then and then hours and hours on in mixing the paints uh, in wet plaster and then and then painting uh, and sometimes it didn't go well and they would literally scrape it off and start again and one of the tenets of Haywood Street is that ministry without saying a word has every opportunity to extend dignity to people to be unapologetic and unflinching and naming and claiming someone's sacred worth. And I saw Chris through the film and Christopher through the fresco painting uh, do that with such faithfulness. I've said it to anybody who will listen, this is easily as important as anything I've ever been a part of. It's up there with my marriage and the two children on the other side of the, the door here this, this evening. So I'm, I'm so thrilled to be here. And as always, I'm far more interested in what you all have to say and look forward to your questions and answers. And thank you again. Thank you, Brian. Um, we'd like to turn to Jeanette now and hear her perspective on what it means to be a part of this community and a part of this, this brilliant fresco. Hi, um, I'm Jeanette. It is, it, sometimes it's so hard to put into words because for me, it's more of a feeling than a definition or description. I had no idea what was missing from my life until I walked through the doors of Haywood. Um, I was someone who was just thriving in the community at the time. Um, I was one who felt clearly unredeemable, unworthy, unwanted, not needed. Uh, due to my own personal addictions, bad life choices, um, someone who, I was born and raised in a Methodist home, but I had no relationship with God. I had no relationship with Jesus. Uh, the only spirit I knew was what I felt at the moment. So I was at a point in my life where I can only blame myself. I can only point the fingers at myself and focus on myself. I blame no one for saying, you know, I've tried and I've been there and uh, I can no longer be consumed with your issues that they're weighing down on my own. So I had had family members, friends, society, who was just pretty much done. And one day as I was fighting to survive. I was working with a temp service and I would take a day off every week to go look for permanent employment. And I was in between interviews one day. One was early in the morning, one was in mid afternoon. And I had left the early morning one and I had some food and an apartment where I was living in public housing. 
But I knew if I had went home to eat lunch, I was bound to fall asleep. I was bound to get too comfortable and want to call and reschedule um, my interview. So I, I didn't want to go home, but I was a little, stomach was growling a little bit. I was talking to a friend who was standing across the street from Hayward. And she says, come on, let's go have some lunch. It'll keep your filled without having to go home. And I looked up and I saw this line and I said, no, I have food at home. Even though at the time it was peanut butter and jelly, but that sometimes, you know, it's not what it is, it's what it does. So I kind of hesitated. I felt bad enough as it was about myself. Talk about self-esteem, low self-esteem. I had no self-esteem. Um, this particular person said, well, just come sit and have a cup of coffee with me while I eat. And I thought, okay. So I went to Haywood. And when I walked in, there was a cafeteria like style room where you got a tray, got in line and went down the line. And without grabbing a tray, just standing at the door, I was immediately mesmerized by the aura in the room and the mixture of the audience at the tables. There were people of all walks of life, all shapes, sizes, nationalities, religions, housed, unhoused. Um, I grew up in a very multiracial family and that reminded me of my grandmother's living room on a particular day with it was dinner. Being that my mother was Cherokee and my father was African, my mother's three brothers were military. Each one had a wife from a different country. So if you could just close your eyes for 2.5 seconds and just mesmerize the people at that table, different nationalities, different religions, Islam, Jehovah Witness, Baptist, Methodist, all at one table, all different shapes and sizes. The only important thing at that table was the love between us all. That was how my grandmother raised us all. So when I walked into Hayward Street and I looked at this room that reminded me of my grandmother's dining room, I thought, <gasps> I was just stunned by the feeling that came over me, by the aura in the room. A lady tapped me on the shoulder and then she gave me a hug. And she says, would you like something to drink? And I thought, someone cares if I have need. Someone has enough love in their heart to open their arms to a complete stranger, not knowing my background, could care less about my background and just wanted to welcome me. Well, to make a long story short, I was instantly just smitten. I ended up coming back one Wednesday. Let me back up a little bit. I did go for that second interview. I did get that job. I was asked at that job, what day of the week would I like off? Because I was only allowed four days out of the week. It was a state job. And I chose Wednesday so I could go back to that church on my days off. Every Wednesday, I continued to pop up at Hayward. First time, I couldn't wait to get a tray so I could sit at a table where I knew no one and no one knew me, but yet be involved just to be present. Not what anyone in the room could do for me, not what anyone in the room, I could do anything for them, but just being with gave me a sense of self-worth, gave me a sense of love that I hadn't felt in a very, very long time. I continued to come. I was asked to help one day in a clothing closet, sorting, hanging, Eventually, one day, as I was going through the dining room, someone handed me a tray and said, can you take this to that table? 
I ended up working at the downtown welcome table for a while where my relationship with those in the community began to flourish and they didn't know it, but they became my family. Eventually I became a part of their family every Wednesday. Well, one day while singing with the choir in a church, I happened to look around the room and see a familiar face. The following Wednesday, when I got back to Haywood, I was asked by this familiar face, which is Brian, of course, if I would share a song with the congregation. At this point in time, I began to feel more than just someone who's welcome, someone who's wanted, but I began to feel a calling as I also began a relationship with the God that I never knew because I knew all this had to be happening out of spirit. None of this was planned by me. None of this was even dreamt of by me. This had to be a calling. I needed to get to know this God more. And that has been accomplished by hearing and reading his word. Not just studying, because you can memorize Genesis and Revelations. It doesn't do a bit of good unless you use it on a daily basis on everyone you come in contact with. That was the most valuable lesson I learned while I was at Haywood, and I could not wait to get there every day that the doors were open to use what I was learning through my relationship with Christ on those I came in contact with. So to make a longer story even short, till this very day, when the doors of Haywood are open, I'm either passing by, walking by, or having a seat talking to any and everyone who happens to be there because the love that Hayward gave me when the world turned its back on me, Hayward opened their arms. I personally took it upon myself to do that to someone else because the love I've received since being in Hayward has not just lifted my self-esteem, made me feel of value, made me feel wanted. But Haywood helped me heal. Haywood heals with the love that is given for one another. Haywood is not just a part of my life. Haywood is part of my foundation. I cannot thrive without Haywood. And I no longer survive, I thrive with Haywood for others. And I will be on the premises and look down the street and see someone coming, just the look on their face. Sometimes I know exactly how they feel. It's not pity. For me, it's not pity. It's more like I just want to wrap my arms around them and share. Because I have felt how they feel. And occasionally, I do still feel some type of way about certain type of things. I was so broken when I first came back. Someone asked me the other day, so are you whole now? And I thought, I don't know if I'll ever be whole. I don't know what it means to be whole. But I know that no matter what I incur in my life, no matter what happens, no matter what trauma tribulation I go through, the arms wrapped around me of those at Haywood, the love I get at Haywood keeps me so strong that whatever it is that comes along, I can do. And I know that the love I'm getting from each and every person there is the love that God is giving them and giving me. So it is now my lifetime pursuit to get the love God gives to me, the love I can give at Haywood to get to everyone else I come encounter for the rest of my life. 
through the money. I could not live without it. I could not survive without it. It's just not going to happen. Thank you. And thank you, Jeanette. What a beautiful story. Um, I'm, I'm speechless. What a beautiful story. It's, it's just so wonderful to hear you fill in the gaps of what God intends for our world to be and, um, and, and those glimpses of, of how we can do it. Um, so we're going to shift now and, um, and hear from Christina, who will make the connection for us between the importance of art and our worship spaces and, and how those have come to life really through um, through the whole history of the church. Um, Christina. Hello, everybody, and thank you so, so much for having me. Um, I was so impressed with the film, with the fresco, with the mission and work of Haywood Street Congregation, that it is just a complete delight to be here and to, to be introduced to the work that God is doing in this part of Western North Carolina. Um, I am a doctoral student at Duke Divinity School. I'm currently writing my dissertation. I have two little kids as well, or I have one little kid as well, not two yet. Um, so I have a toddler who might toddle in here in a minute too. Um, but yeah, I'm so, so privileged to be a part of this conversation tonight. Um, a major theme that I picked up on in the film is a way that the fresco was designed to acknowledge. The painting acknowledges the dignity of the people that populate it when society at large was quick to dismiss them. Um, you hear this word throughout the film multiple times, acknowledge, acknowledge. But tonight I wanted to think about this fresco as a work of acknowledgement within specific, a specific context, and that's the work of liturgical art. So another way to talk about acknowledgement is it bears witness. What does the, this artwork bear witness to? Well, pretty obviously it bears witness to particular individuals. I love that on the website, you can navigate through the painting person by person, learning a little bit more about who they are and how they contribute to the life of the community. Um, in this way, the painting bears witness to the unique, the unique ways that God has moved in and moves through each person's life. The painting also bears witness to the work of God in at Haywood Street. There are references to Haywood's sponsor church, the church building is present, and the table that figures the Ministry of Food Hospitality that is so central to Haywood, that's also present. Um, in depicting these figures, the fresco is bearing witness to the reconciling and recreative work of the Holy Spirit in and among you all at Haywood. But overall, I think this fresco as a piece of liturgical art which is just to say a piece of art found in corporate worship, bears witness to Jesus Christ. When God's people gather in worship, they gather in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Their gathering bears witness in so many ways to the redeeming love of that God for his people as demonstrated and affected in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Further, we celebrate and ask for the transforming power of the Holy Spirit sent by Jesus to continue God's good work among us. I think that there are many, many, many ways that this painting participates in the holy work of bearing witness to Jesus Christ's love for his people. So I'm just going to talk about three here tonight. So first and most beautifully, the fresco bears witness to Jesus by showing us our savior in the least of these. Um, as Brian mentioned earlier, the title of the film and the website mentioned Jesus's beatitudes multiple times. Um, this is the main, main reference point in scripture. Um, I was also reminded of Matthew's eschatological vision of Jesus Christ's reign in his kingdom. 
there in Matthew 25, the enthroned Jesus says to his people, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance which is the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you look after, looked after me. I was in prison and you came to me. And as we know, God's people respond by asking, when did we do this for you? <laughs> Then Jesus responds, truly, I tell you, whenever you did this for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that I can show you a place where I have seen this logic at work in, um, in our, another artwork before. Can you see that, everyone? Awesome. This is a painting by, it's an altarpiece actually. So it's other, it's another artwork that is behind um, the main activity at the front of the church. Um, this reality is pictured in this altarpiece by Master of Alkmaar from the Netherlands. It depicts these acts that are mentioned by Jesus in Matthew, which are sometimes called the works of mercy. But what is interesting about this is Jesus is a part of the crowd. I want to show you a few of these up close. So here we have the hungry being fed. Here they are coming to receive food from the basket. And here we see Jesus as the one that looks out to us and says, will you do the same? Similarly here, where the thirsty are being given a drink. Here, I'll go ahead and stop that share. You can look at that artwork later. I'll put the link um, in the in the chat later so you can look at it if you're interested. But for Christians who live in this redeemed upside down or right side up world, real true beauty is exemplified in those who look like Christ. And we see this beauty in the hungry, the thirsty, the sick. But, and this is what I love about the Haywood fresco. Those who were once hungry are now by the work of Jesus's spirit, the ones who are offering the food and the drink. The fresco then bears witness to a beautiful circle of redemption that is affected by Jesus Christ. Um, and in another way, the painting bears witness to Jesus by including the elements of communion. Charlie and Jeanette, um, as sentinel figures, they carry the stalks of wheat and the wineskin. And more centrally, the people emerging from the mist carry a table conveying a pitcher of wine and a basket of bread. As I mentioned earlier, this is reflective of the ministry of food hospitality that is so central to Haywood's mission but it's also reflective of a central practice of the Christian faith instituted by Jesus himself. As the priest or the pastor says, when praying over the elements of communion, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, broke it, gave thanks and said, take this my body, which is broken for you. He repeats this with the cup when he lifts it up and says, take this my blood, which is shed for you. While there have been many controversies about how Jesus makes himself present in the bread and the wine, or grape juice for you Methodists, all Christians affirm that he is with us when we eat this special meal. John Calvin suggested that by the spirit, we are lifted up into the heavenly throne room of Christ when we celebrate this meal, encountering and feasting on Jesus in his glory. And the mist and the angels in that fresco make me think of this holy throne room. But the mountains and the people in the Haywood fresco remind me that this throne room is right here in North Carolina. The fresco then bears witness to Christ's presence in the elements of communion. And finally, and quickly here at the end, I thought of one other way that the painting bears witness to Jesus. And it's in the very process of the fresco itself. I was captivated by the film's following of Christopher Holt's artistic process. This is an ancient technique that, was, that has absolutely been given new life in Christopher Holt's painting. 
but I was particularly struck by the artist's description of what happens to the pigment when it's applied to the wet plaster. He says that the lime being the binder pulls the pigment, a pigment which is made from the earth, pulls that pigment into it. It's bound, it's captured, it's held by the wall. It becomes the wall. Is this not a beautiful picture of Jesus's reconciling work for creation? Christians believe that humans are created from and therefore super connected to the earth. We are dust, just like the dust that this pigment is derived from. But when we encounter the spirit of the living God in Jesus Christ, we are pulled into God's own life and made glorious. In the same way that that solid blank wall embraces the fluid pigments so that God's life, so God's life embraces his creatures. Just as the pigment becomes one with the wall, so God's children are transformed into the image of Jesus, as 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The very process of the painting, then, bears witness to the transforming and renewing and beautifying work of Jesus Christ. This acknowledgement, this bearing witness to Jesus, is what I think makes this artwork very special. It would be a great privilege to worship with it week by week, having our eyes transformed through the spirit to see and acknowledge Jesus's presence in the unexpected, in our poor, in our meals, and in our paintings. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a wonderful way to draw it all together and, um, and, and capture so much of what is present in the film, but of course, what is present um, on the wall as, uh, as people gather for worship. We do have a few, uh, a few questions to pose. I'm gonna uh, send the first question to Brian because I think it's an easy question, Brian, and you'll be glad to be asked this. Uh, the question is, did you raise enough money to cover the cost of the fresco? And if you didn't, how can people fill in the gap? That's a very generous question, and, and Ron had reached out a little earlier. Yes, we, we raised enough money and more, and folks have been uh, inspired by this painting and been very generous in the res response. One thing to mention, however, is that Charles Burns, who's the light bearer opposite of Jeanette, uh, was dying of cancer when we painted him. He has since passed, and we started an endowment in his name, and that endowment goes to to fund the fresco host that welcomes different groups and, and to support the ongoing life of the fresco. So that's an opportunity to give if anybody feels led. But yes, we, we've paid for the fresco uh, and, and all the artists and uh, models and uh, we're in great shape. Thank you, Brian. You should put that donation link in the uh, chat window so you can take advantage of all of these wonderful people here tonight. <laughs> Um, Jeanette, I'd like to ask you a question, if, if you don't mind. Um, you talked a lot about your personal story and the work of, of Haywood, but can you say something to us tonight about how it feels to be a face of the fresco? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, when I was first asked to be in the fresco, I was already at the point that anything I could do for anyone at Haywood was beyond my wildest dreams, more than happy to. I had no idea at the time that I would be such a large figure, even though I was told I would be one of the statues. I thought, okay, well, representing this fabulous place and these fabulous people, which to me, What's more important is not just so much what's inside of Haywood, with the good food, you know, the clothing closet, you know, the acupuncture, the yoga, anything else that goes on. I value most of the relationships I've created with each and every person. So to finally, even though, well, let me put it this way, even though I spent a lot of time with Chris, we all spent a lot of time with Chris and both Chris's and all of the artists, I think that 
kind of didn't allow me to so much think of the importance or the size of myself in the fresco. It wasn't until the actual, almost the end of it, the more I would visit while they were working, the more I began to realize I'm awful large. And then I thought, you know, I started doing some rituals of my own and I thought I will be on this wall as long as this wall exists, I could be here for thousands of years. I could be here for hundreds of years. And I thought, well, you know, hopefully by then, thousands of people will have made their way to Hayward. And they will understand why we are in this fresco as we are. They too will not just look at the fresco, but feel the fresco, feel the feelings of those in the fresco. Um, again, I, I didn't think I would be that large. The more I think of it, the more I look at it, the more I talk about it, the more I'm so humbled and honored. I have no more words. I'm just beside myself the fact that someone would want me to be a representative of a house of God that just loves the world and everyone in it that walks by or comes to the doors. Me personally, when I looked at myself up there, I thought as a light bearer, yeah, you need to, see, this is how you can save this place. You need to be here. This is where you need to come. As was quoted in the Bible, come all ye who are heavy laden and burdened and I will give you rest. I thought, come, you will find rest here if only in your soul. And to me, that's the main priority and the importance of being in Fresco, having a Fresco, Hayward's existence, and all those in it. It's the inner peace you get within yourself from being around those who unconditionally love you, regardless of what you've done, what you haven't done, what you, haven't done, what you have, what you don't have. You know what I mean? What you look like, what you don't look like, doesn't matter. It's all about love. And it's a love I've never known. Other than your grandma. Thank you for so graciously answering what was probably a very personal question. Um, Christina, I, um, I have a question for you and to, to draw on your depth of knowledge. Can you say a little bit to our folks here tonight uh, about how the images that bear witness in our liturgical spaces have changed some through the years? I hope I'm not putting you on the spot with that question. No, that's fine. They, um, and they definitely have. Um, <laughs> so I am interested in my own particular research. Um, I'm focused on modernist visual art, actually. So I like to say that I like to look at paintings when they start to get a little weird. <laughs> so, um, and what I'm interested in is finding Jesus in the way that those paintings that maybe the artists wouldn't say bear witness to Jesus, um, and you wouldn't be able to see Jesus very um, clearly in, in the paint. I'm interested in seeing the ways that they do bear witness to their creator, um, their ultimate creator, that is. so. So yeah, so I've looked at a lot of um, ecclesial art from modernist um, painters and man, it is so, so, so different. And it is very, very limited because one of the main changes that we see in liturgical art through the last millennium is that the church no longer is a patron. No, the church no longer, I should say, because in light of Haywood's patronage, I should say the church no longer is the main, the primary patron for the arts. So like the altarpiece that I showed earlier, that was um, commissioned and established by the church for the church, for the wider community. And that is a practice that not only supported the artistic life of the community, but it supported the life of the church as well. Now, as things change, changed very much and due to a million different factors, the separation of church and state, um, the different ways that money was being held, um, patronage for, for artworks really left the hands of the church. 
And I think, unfortunately, we what we see sometimes in our contemporary church is is a um, a negative perception of the arts generally, unfortunately. Um, and like it's said in the documentary, um, for people who, for churches that are focused on ministry to people who have a lot of needs, which we all have a lot of needs, but maybe have a lot of financial need, to spend a quarter of a million dollars on a painting seems like maybe a crazy idea. Um, and that's the kind of thinking that so many of our churches have these days, unfortunately. But like um, Reverend Combs said so beautifully in the documentary, um, art, music, love, these things are just as important um, and to a thriving life. Like Jeanette said, she's not just living, she's thriving. Um, and that's what God wants for his children. God wants his children to be thriving. So I am so excited to see this picture, this return to patronage and done in a new and a different and even more Christ-like way um, that we say, see here in Haywood. And man, go and tell all of your churches to be patrons of the arts because it is exciting and it's important and it's for um, the good of his creation, the good of his people. Thank you, that was wonderful. Um... We're, we're running short on time, but I want to come back to Brian and, and ask uh, another question related to the money, but not to the money, more to the vision of what Christina was just saying and, and how you became a patron to the arts at Haywood Street. But were there times uh, when you thought that this fresco would never happen? And, uh, and in those times, where did you draw on, um, on, on strength for the journey? As an undergrad, I was at the School of Design uh, in Raleigh, and I, I'm convinced that of all the metaphors that abound throughout scripture, God is uh, a sower, a shepherd, a salt, a gate. Um, God is, is artist, is, is primary for me. Um, so this is not a, a new idea for me. When I was in painting and pottery class, that felt every bit as much as worship is, is consecrating the elements uh, in communion. Uh, Jennifer, to answer your question, we, we, we thought hard about the, the foundational text for Haywood Street of, of, of um, the, the woman in the alabaster jar uh, anointing Jesus's feet, and then she's critiqued for being so terribly wasteful. And uh, that is a critique we have heard throughout Haywood Street. Our welcome table meal is homemade. It's $20 a plate. The, the plate literally that you eat on costs $100 in a retail store, uh, that we are being absolutely reckless with our money. And that's a theological point I want to make over and over again. Uh, it, it's one that feels thoroughly Christian in every way. Uh, and that was part of the resistance on the front end of, of the fresco. This is, this is money that's in the nonprofit world where people are constantly competing with one another over um, notions of scarcity that a dollar can be stretched for far more utilitarian purposes. And, and here is a church that is being uh, scandalous in its wastefulness. And that felt exactly right to me. That felt entirely faithful to me. Um, I, honestly, I didn't spend a lot of time worrying about when the money or how it would show up. Our responsibility is simply to follow the calling and wherever that leads is wherever it leads. Uh, it was clear to me Christopher was willing to work for free. <laughs> it didn't matter to him uh, and everybody involved uh, felt a sense of uh, inspiration from the spirit. And ultimately that's how the early church started without any money anyway, <laughs> without any programming. And that, that, that's very much been our, our story in lots of ways at Haywood Street. That's, that's great. I, I was so struck by your comment about, um, about being reckless that it reminded me of my mentor's um, statement and, and um, my work is in homiletics. And he said, when um, mentioning the parable of the sower, that, that it's not about this kind of soil or that kind of soil or rocks or thorns. It's, it's about the abundance of seeds. 
And God just throws these seeds everywhere because God's got all the seeds in the world and God can put those seeds wherever God wants them. Um, and some will grow and some won't, but that's really beside the point, which I thought was a nice way to turn upside down that parable and point it back to God, which of course is what all parables should do. Um, so thank you for, uh, for reminding us all of that. We are drawing near the end of our time. Um, I, I don't have any more questions and I have not seen other questions pop up in our chat window. So I just wanna take these last couple of minutes to thank the three of you as our panelists for all of the warmth that you brought to the screen tonight and, um, and all of the wisdom that you were willing to share with our audience. And, um, and of course to Chris, um, we are ever so grateful to you for making this movie. And, uh, and helping to tell the story of what is so magnificent and so wonderful and such uh, a testimony to the beloved community and, uh, and to the paradise that God has waiting for us when we finally learn how to live into it. So uh, with, with that, uh, I would invite everyone to unmute themselves and uh, wish each other a good evening and um, and I wish you the best to go and serve God in all that you do.